Hey guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. Boas tend to be pretty healthy animals, and if you give them the right husbandry, you're not likely to have any issues. And there's really only four health-related issues that affect the majority of boas, or should I say, these are the there's four health-related issues that you're by far the most likely to experience if you have any kind of health-related issue. So today I'm gonna to talk about these four health-related issues that affect boas, say a little bit about how you can prevent them, and if you are unlucky enough to have, be struck by them, you can treat them. There's also one health-related issue you hear a lot about, but I'm really convinced that it's probably not that much of a big deal, certainly not as much as it's made out to be. So I'm gonna comment on that health-related issue as well. So a lot, a lot of good information here, so be sure to stay tuned. So the first health-related issue, and I can't really call this a disease in and of itself, because it's really more of a parasite, but this is probably by far the most common thing that you're likely to encounter, and that, of course, is mites. And I've talked a lot about snake and reptile mites in previous videos, so I'll refer you to those for the complete uh, commentary. But I'll just say here that mites are unfortunately extremely common. Almost all reptile shows will have mites somewhere. So if you go to a reptile show, a mite, mite, a mite might come home with you and start an infestation. And so unfortunately it appears that these mites are becoming more and more tolerant to the treatments that we're using. They're becoming resistant to the permethrin spray, the, you know, the, the parentamide or bedding spray, and you know, several other types of treatments as well. And it kind of makes sense that the more they're exposed to these chemicals, you have some animals in the population that have some resistance and they survive and they reproduce and pass those genes on. Mites by themselves are probably not really a disease since they're basically just sucking the blood from your boa. And you know, one mite is just a very small animal. It's probably not gonna do a huge amount of damage. But collectively, a large amount of mites can actually suck a bow up dry and the bow might end up dying just because of the loss of blood to the mites. Mites are also thought to spread several different types of diseases. Um, but probably the by far the worst about the mites is the psychological torture that they are for the keeper because these things are very, very hard to eradicate and you can't really see them. And sometimes you don't even know if they're there. So it becomes kind of like a nightmare. And I actually experienced the mite nightmare back in 2016. You know, I went to a reptile show, last time I ever went to a reptile show and I picked up a hog island boa there and it was from a reputable seller. I'm not even sure that the mites came from the seller himself. They may well have picked up a mite from some other booth or something. The mite was crawling around the show and managed to somehow get on my clothing and make it into the snake. But um, I had the snake and I went through quarantine. I quarantined the animal for about a month and a half. I didn't see any mites, thought I was fine. Then I made the mistake of introducing the animal into my main snake room. And then I noticed about a week later, the snake was soaking and I saw mites and I'm like, oh shit, you know, this, how did this happen? And uh, it was almost like this flash of panic because I know how, how hard these things are to get rid of. And so I used a number of different treatments and I would treat the entire collection and then I would wait a couple weeks, treat them again. And I repeated this like three times and this, I had head mites a few years earlier, the only other time, and I just treated them like this and it was fine and the mites were gone. But in this particular case, the mites just kept coming back. You know, we did go through a few months, I think that I have no mite mites, I'm finally over the problem. But then I would see a snake soaking in the water dish and I would see the mites in there. If you see these little black flecks that almost look like poppy seeds from a bagel, those are mites. And the snakes will usually soak in the water dish to try to drown the mites and get some relief. So finally, the only way I could get rid of them, I used several treatments at once. I hung a no pest strip in the snake room and I used um, not preventamite, but permethrin, which is the active ingredient. You can get it in this, be this uh, bedding spray that you spray for bed bugs. And I used those, plus I put diatomaceous earth on the floor to prevent mites from migrating. And finally that worked, but it took me 
just over a year to get rid of these damn mites and I was pulling my hair out the amount of stress that I was under the amount of lost sleep um, it was just a nightmare so trust me you don't want to get mites so what I would recommend you really need to quarantine your animals three months at the minimum for a new animal that you bring in you want to be absolutely sure there's no mites you know if you can quarantine it for six months that's even better but you want to keep that animal away from your main collection until you're absolutely certain there's no mites you also want to change your clothing you don't want to go to like pet shops that might have mites and wear the same clothing because the mites can even get on people's clothing and be brought into someone's collection they're just an absolute nightmare to deal with so mites are the first of the four things that's likely to end your reptile journey and your reptile keeping and again the, the mites usually don't end don't don't result in the death of the boa by itself but i know there's several people who've actually gotten out of reptile keeping at least several people because of the mites even some big name breeders they just tried everything to get rid of these mites they're just pulling their hair out and then they just decided well it's just not working it's just not worth it anymore i'm getting out of reptiles because of these damn mites so they're really a nightmare to deal with so you know you definitely don't want to get these reptile mites the second of the four health conditions that's likely to affect your boa is a respiratory infection and these infections typically result when your boa is exposed to colder than optimal temperatures for an extended period of time it can also be related to the air being too dry or even too humid and these infections are most commonly seen after cycling for breeding so many breeders will drop the temperatures of their animals by you know 10 or 20 degrees for a few months some of them only do it at night some of them do it 24 hours a day but doing this can sometimes result in the snakes getting these respiratory infections and i have actually changed my cycling over the years i've done less and less drops now i drop the temperatures about 10 to 12 degrees fahrenheit only at night only for about a month and a half to two months and in some cases i don't drop the temperatures at all so any time i saw any symptoms of respiratory infections in animals i made a note of that and then the following year or the following breeding i didn't drop the temperatures for those animals and honestly it has not affected my breeding success you don't necessarily need to drop the temperatures and so the respiratory infection symptoms you might see uh, some bubbling from your snake's nose or mouth you might see some open mouth breathing like the snake is having trouble breathing uh, it might be making some noises when it's breathing like a rasping sound or a popping or clicking sound but any of these symptoms are likely uh, caused by a respiratory infection they can be caused by other things as well especially sometimes some snakes will make a little bit of a noise when they move and it's not necessarily a respiratory infection but if you see that bubbling and mucus chances are pretty good it's a respiratory infection and so if a respiratory infection is very very mild sometimes if you just raise the temperatures in your snake's enclosure by around five degrees or so sometimes that'll that'll take care of it but usually by the time you see a respiratory infection symptoms it's you need to go to a vet and you need to get some antibiotics and if you don't have the antibiotics you're not going to knock it out and it's just going to be this infection that goes on and eventually it's going to result in your snake's death so you definitely want to take care of that and then in the future you want to prevent it by again not dropping the temperatures when you're breeding and even if you're not breeding maybe you're temperatures are just too low or your snake maybe the humidity is not right if the humidity is too low sometimes that can lead to the infections or even if it's too high sometimes that can lead to the infection so you want to keep your humidity around 60 70 percent relative humidity and you want to keep the hot spot so that it's around 90 degrees or so so that your snake can warm up with the cool side about 75 to 80 for most types of boas and hopefully that will prevent the respiratory infection but don't wait if you see symptoms you want to go to a qualified reptile vet get some antibiotics and take care of that before it gets too severe so the third type of health issue that affects boas most often is another type of bacterial infection 
and this is known as stomatitis. It's also known as various types of rot, you know, scale rot, mouth rot, belly rot, for example. And it's not really a rot in the sense, it's not like a fungus that's rotting the snake away. It's actually a infection, an infection with different types of bacteria that is resulting in this necrosis, this death of the tissue, and this decomposition of the tissue. It's a really, really nasty infection if it gets uh, progresses too far. And so what, what leads to stomatitis is the snake has an injury and the injury becomes infected and then it becomes this chronic condition. The infection sets in and then it actually starts to rot away the snake, so to speak, and then eventually results in the death when it destroys enough tissue. And so probably the most likely way this happens, and this has happened to me several times, is that you have a snake that's somewhat active or nervous and your bow is kind of rubbing his snout on the side of the cage and he'll keep doing this and it wears away the snout and causes kind of a lesion or injury. And then that injury becomes infected and then it starts having this, you know, the bacterial infection and the necrosis. And then you start to see the, the, the dead, dead tissue and it starts to stink and get really nasty. Uh, so you definitely don't want to let it get that far. The other, another way is uh, when a snake soaks in a water dish, sometimes snakes will soak when they want to shed or something like that. And usually it's no big deal, but if a snake is in there too long, the um, water, you know, the scales can kind of get penetrated with the water and they don't dry out and they become infected. And um, this is also known as blister disease when they have these kind of like these puffy blisters because of the soaking for too long. And then if that becomes infected and the infection kind of takes off, then it can lead to the scale rod and the belly rod and eventually the necrosis and loss of the tissue. And so these types of conditions, if they're treated early on, they're usually pretty easy to treat. So if you see a snake that's just starting to rub and it hasn't set in the infection yet, what you should do is you should alter the enclosure so the snake doesn't do that anymore. Sometimes snakes will rub when they're nervous. You might want to put in more hiding places so that they can hide and be less nervous. Sometimes they just don't like the substrate. You might want to change the substrate, something they feel more comfortable on. Um, sometimes they're just looking for food. So you might want to feed them more. Of course, you don't want your snake to be overweight, so you don't want to overdo it. But if you're not feeding your snake enough and the snake is exploring the cage, it might rub its snout and lead to the, uh, to the stomatitis. If it progresses to the point where there's the symptoms and the necrosis, typically with mouth rot, you'll see that the snake's mouth is partially open and you might notice this white cheesy like substance hanging out. So that's, that means it's already progressed fairly significantly. At that point, you can't just simply change the, the, the uh, enclosure. What you're gonna need to do is go to a vet, get some antibiotics, and you're gonna have to aggressively start doing a treatment to remove the infected material, uh, which really isn't all that easy. So basically you're gonna have to disinfect the site with you know, a disinfectant like chlorhexidine or iodine or something like that. And then you're gonna have to gently remove all of that infected tissue. And if you're kind of squeamish, it's probably gonna be pretty difficult. So like I said, you definitely wanna get a vet to help you. You have to remove the tissue, keep it nice and clean. And then eventually, once you've done that long enough, you, you've knocked out the infection along with the antibiotics and the snake can heal and go on and you know make new skin. And um, you know with the condition of blister disease, sometimes it's just when the snake is shedding. So if you let the snake shed and then you get it off that wet substrate or that those wet dirty conditions, the condition will spontaneously resolve. But once it's too far gone, you really need antibiotics to knock out the infection. And even if the snake has um, really kind of messed up its snout or its belly or whatever's been infected and it look you know, pretty nasty, snakes can heal, you know, boas especially, they can heal really well. And typically within just a few sheds, there's very little trace of the, the lesion. In fact, I had a, a Colombian boa that was doing it a couple years ago and just rubbing and I don't know if he was looking for a mate or he just wanted more food or what, but 
he ended up having necrosis in, or um, stomatitis, mouth rot in his mouth. And so I was able to treat him with antibiotics and clean out his mouth by squirting chlorhexidine in there and just kind of removing all that disgusting, cheesy like substance. And I just kept doing that for several weeks and as well as give him, giving him the antibiotics and then eventually he healed and stopped doing that. And you know, after a few sheds, you couldn't even tell he had it. I mean, there was just a very slight indication of a scar on his uh, the side of his face. But other than that, he was back to normal and doing well. Um, so those types of necrosis or the different rots are a fairly common condition. Um, not that hard to treat if you treat it early, but once it sets in, it gets harder and harder to treat and can ultimately lead to the, the death of your boa. And now finally, the fourth condition that you're likely to experience as a boa keeper is regurgitation syndrome. And I've talked about regurgitation before, but what causes regurgitation is typically if you feed a baby boa, a, a rodent that's too large, or if you feed the feedings too close together, and or if you have temperatures that are inappropriate, especially too hot, what will happen is you feed your baby boa and then about three to four days later, you'll notice this wet, slimy rodent that's been regurgitated. It smells awful. And uh, usually inexperienced keepers will panic and they'll feed the animal another rodent a few days later. But that's the worst thing you can do because the snake's uh, esophagus and mouth have undergone uh, trauma when it's regurgitated. So when you feed it another one, that's just gonna exacerbate the trauma. You have to let your snake heal. So if you ever have a regurgitation, do not feed for at least three, preferably four weeks to the next feeding. And then you wanna feed a rodent that's slightly smaller than what would be normal for that size snake. It's always best to get a fresh rodent rather than a frozen rodent just so that the snake has a really nice fresh meal. And then you wanna be really gentle with the snake, don't handle it after it feeds, and make sure the temperatures are right on where they should be. Uh, and then hopefully your snake won't regurgitate again. If you have the snake regurgitate more than uh, once, you know, especially if it regurgitates more than twice, that's when it gets really severe because it gets harder and harder to break out of the cycle and you have a snake that eats and then regurgitates and then you feed it again too soon, it does it again, there's a pretty good chance your snake's not gonna make it. Unfortunately, this is probably the number one reason why baby boas, especially the true red tails, don't thrive because they go undergo this regurgitation syndrome and it ends up you know, resulting in their death. Some baby boas, especially red tails, are more susceptible than others. I've noticed that some bloodlines of Suriname are especially susceptible. So you want to do everything you can to uh, just be really gentle with baby boas as far as when you're feeding them. You don't want to overfeed them or feed them a meal that's too large. This is also why it's definitely a good idea to get a slightly older red tail, especially if you haven't kept them before. So if you're able to find a red tail that's like a year old, you're definitely more likely to have a good experience than if you have a, a baby, especially one that hasn't been well established. And uh, so I recommend if you're if this is your first time getting a red tail, try to find one that's a little bit older, just so hopefully you can prevent having this regurgitation syndrome. So those are the four conditions that uh, you're most likely to experience as a boa keeper. And uh, I've experienced pretty much all of them. I think most people who keep boas for any length of time are gonna have these types of conditions. So it's good to know what to look out for so that you can nip them in the bud early on and they, they don't end up in the death of your animals. So now I'm just briefly gonna talk about one disease which you hear a lot about. And personally, I don't think it's really all that big of a deal. I think it's really overblown. And that's called IBD or inclusion body disease. And I've been following IBD for quite a while since I've been in BOAS. I've read the papers and the scientific journals. I've you know, tried to get as much information as I can. And I've had it on my list of topics for this channel to do a episode on IBD. I get asked to do this pretty often. The reason I haven't done it is that I just can't make sense of the whole thing. 
there's so many opinions out there there's so much information that's contradictory and a lot of it just doesn't really make all that much sense so if you go to any like Facebook or social media if you talk about IBD people will jump in and say yes this is a nightmare it's wiping out collections it's spreading like wildfire I just don't think that that's true and I don't think the evidence indicates that it's true. I think IBD is the boogeyman in the dark. It's something we don't understand and uh, we fear it because of the lack of information. And I think a lot of the things that people attribute to IBD, a lot of the deaths, it's really not IBD, it's something else entirely. It might even just be inadequate husbandry or you know poor keeping conditions. And IBD has been around since at least the 70s, so around 50 years or so. And yet we still really don't understand what causes it or what it is. I mean, the, the best guess, the best evidence indicates it's an arena virus. When IBD was first described, the mo most of the symptoms were CNS or central nervous system. So the animals would have disorientation and these corkscrewing movements, and they were unable to right themselves if you put them on their back. But lately, or you know, since then, a lot of uh, cases of IBD have been described as more like regurgitation and you know susceptibility to respiratory infections and other things like that. There's not much consensus in the literature about how fast the disease progresses or about how prevalent it is. There's papers that indicate that up to around 40% of boas tested have this arena virus. You know, the vast majority of these boas don't go on to develop the symptoms of IBD. Um, in addition, the, how, how fast it spreads is not really well understood. There's papers that would indicate that it doesn't really spread that much. They've tested collections every year for several years, even collections where the husbandry and the um, sanitary conditions were not very good, and yet they, they don't see much spread of the virus. So it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense overall, you know, exactly what's going on here. So I don't think we're gonna understand this thing really well anytime soon, to be honest, just because there's not much research funding for diseases of reptiles. It's not like cancer or AIDS or something like that. So it comes down to common sense. The first thing that I'm pretty convinced about is that IBD does not spread nearly as fast as a lot of people on social media make it out to be. It's not spreading through the air because if it was, it would have wiped out all the boas by now. Whenever you have a disease that spreads like wildfire, it tends to kill a lot of affected animals or people really fast, but then it burns itself out, things like Ebola virus. And so this disease has been around since the 70s, and yet um, most boas do not have the disease. They don't display the symptoms of the disease. So it's pretty unlikely that it's really spreading nearly as fast as they make it out. The other thing is I don't think that it's spreading through the air. I think it would have to spread from snake to snake through you know, secretions or saliva or sexual contact, things like that. So if you keep a snake in a separate cage by itself, like most people recommend, you know, not to cohabitate, you're not likely to have the disease spread. And if you quarantine animals when bringing them into the collection, hopefully you can see if there's any symptoms of IBD, although who knows, I mean, it could be incubating for many years, so you might not be able to quarantine for long enough. But you wanna keep your snakes in separate enclosures, and you wanna not share things between enclosures. You wanna sanitize instruments that you use, like feeding tongs, things like that. You don't want to feed a, uh, a boa a rat that you previously offered to another boa in another cage and it didn't eat it. You just wanna keep everything as um, clean as possible. And I think that's probably your best bet to avoid not just IBD, but a lot of other diseases and husbandry issues as well. And so as I mentioned, I'll try to do a video at some point in the future going more into IBD and you know what I've come to understand about it. But I don't think that this is something that is really all that likely to kill your bow. I've, I've never seen a case of it in my own collection. I know many bow keepers who've never seen this. Um, I'm not even necessarily convinced that it's just one condition, to be honest. I think you might have a, a number of different things that people are calling IBD. And, you know, in addition to what is you know the legitimate IBD, um, but there might be other things as well. 
and um, again, I don't feel, I'm pretty convinced based on the evidence that IBD is not spreading like wildfire. And if you just keep animals in separate enclosures, keep everything clean and you don't share things between enclosures, it's pretty unlikely you're gonna get an animal infected uh, with IBD that way. So again, I wish I could tell you more definitively, but if any, any of these things to, to lose sleep at night about, I wouldn't worry about IBD. It's the other four things I talked about, you're much more likely to experience as a boa keeper. Anyway, I hope this video was somewhat helpful. Please let me know your thoughts. You know, if you've had any experiences with these conditions, including IBD, you know, write it in the comments below so we can all benefit from your experience. Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.